Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ben Barrows. I'm the Dean of the College of Law. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's lecture by Professor Keith Whittington of Princeton University. Professor Whittington's lecture is part of the Stranahan National Issues Forum, a lecture series initiated in 1990 through an endowment from the Stranahan family. The forum is a joint program between the University of Toledo College of Law and the College's Federalist Society, with the purpose of addressing issues of national importance through the lens of the American legal system. Over 40 of the nation's leading academics, economists, historians, political scientists, and public policy professionals have participated in the Stranahan National Issues Forum, and we are delighted to add Professor Whittington to this group today. To introduce Professor Whittington, it is my pleasure to turn to Lee J. Strang, the John W. Stepler Professor of Law and Values here at the College of Law. Professor Strang came to the College of Law in 2008 after teaching at two other law schools. He's an accomplished teacher and scholar. Among his many other duties, he is the faculty advisor to the College of Law's Federalist Society chapter, and he is the coordinator of this lecture series. Please join me in welcoming Professor Strang. Thank you so much, Dean Barrows. Today's Stranahan Lecture, like the Stranahan Lecture Series more generally, provides a necessary contribution, a necessary perspective to our university's debates and discussions on important national issues. It's therefore my distinct pleasure to introduce this spring Stranahan Lecturer, Professor Keith E. Whittington. Professor Whittington, the William Nelson Cromwell Professor of Politics at Princeton University, is a graduate of the University of Texas and Yale University a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the recipient of numerous scholarly and teaching awards, Professor Whittington is a prolific scholar on a variety of subjects, including today's topic, free speech. He's the author of over 80 articles, essays, and book chapters. It actually took me a while to count them. He's the author or editor of 12 books, including today's book, Speak Freely, Why Universities Must Defend Free Speech. In his Stranahan lecture today, Professor Whittington will explain the need to protect free speech at universities in order to enhance their mission of assembling and nurturing an open and diverse community of scholars, teachers, and students. Professor Whittington will speak for approximately 25 minutes, leaving 25 to 30 minutes for your questions and comments. Please join me in welcoming Professor Whittington. So thank you. Thanks for coming out. Um, appreciate you all um, taking the time uh, to do this. Um, I do hope to sort of queue up um, some issues and then uh, get to uh, questions and comments uh, that you all might have. I think those conversations are important and useful ones, um, and so I want to make sure that we um, uh, have uh, sufficient time for them. Um, free speech is a perennial issue on college campuses. Um, it's been of particular significance um, over the last few years and a fair amount of controversy um, surrounding it. Um, it seemed important enough that it was worth um, taking some time uh, to try to think more carefully about free speech issues, try to write out um, this book and that's concerned with trying to um, not just sort of highlight uh, the kinds of free speech problems that have occurred on campuses, which I think a fair number of works uh, tend to want to do, um, but instead try to walk through uh, why we ought to care about free speech um, on the college campus, what principles ought to guide us as we encounter these kind of controversies, and how should we think our way through uh, the kinds of difficulties that arise on college campuses. Um, I think a lot of these questions are not easy questions, they're hard questions, they're complicated questions, um, and so we ought to uh, think carefully about them, and it's useful to try to think carefully about them before we actually find ourselves in the midst um, of a particular uh, controversy or crisis. Um, over free speech on a particular um, campus. It's also true that when I sat down to start um, thinking about this uh, book, I realized I'd been uh, pondering a lot of these issues uh, for quite some time. Um, and in part, um, I hadn't fully appreciated uh, until I started writing um, the relationship I saw between uh, concerns about free speech on college campuses um, and concerns about what the point of higher education is uh, in the first place. Um, so I started thinking back to uh, really one of the first things that sort of triggered uh, these issues in my mind, which was a controversy that arose not too long after 9-11, uh, when the University of North Carolina, which has a long-standing uh, uh, summer reading program for a book that's assigned for incoming uh, freshmen to read, uh, these uh, kinds of programs have become quite popular. Lots of other institutions um, have adopted uh, similar kinds of uh, summer reading for incoming uh, freshmen. Uh, University of North Carolina is unusual, I think, among uh, those institutions in, in offering a relatively serious scholarly book 
um, to students and having them engage the kinds of books that they would actually encounter um, on college syllabi and college classrooms. Lots of universities, um, I think, uh, don't aim that high uh, in the kinds of books that they offer. Uh, but after 9-11, the University of North Carolina to decide to use that opportunity to try to familiarize students with basic issues associated with Islam, try to get them to begin thinking about um, uh, the countries and peoples and ideas um, that the United States was uh, starting to think about more seriously um, after those terrorist attacks. And so they assigned the uh, scholarly book um, that, was cons that had um, uh, passages from the Quran and commentary on those uh, passages. Um, this turned out to be a controversial selection. Um, a number of conservative Christian students objected um, to being um, asked to read a book that included passages from a holy text other than uh, the Bible itself. Um, their parents objected on their behalf. Eventually, uh, conservative interest groups uh, became involved, and eventually state legislators uh, became involved and began to criticize um, the university for having assigned this book. There were threats to the budget of the University of North Carolina as a consequence of assigning this book uh, and the like. Eventually, the, the controversy blew over. Um, the book uh, reading went forward. Students talked about the book. Some of them neglected to read the book, I'm sure. Um, and everyone moved on um, to new controversies and new sets of concerns. But part of the time, what I found particularly disturbing about this incident was the way a lot of students were reacting to this assignment in the first place. The, the part of the pushback was precisely this idea of, I shouldn't have to read a book that runs contrary to my own set of values. I shouldn't have to read a book that's going to challenge the kinds of ideas and beliefs that are fundamental um, to my own life. It may, left me wondering what these students thought they were doing coming to college in the first place. What did they think they were going to encounter on a college campus, except people who wanted to have serious arguments about serious ideas that sometimes, in fact, would be challenging the kinds of ideas and beliefs that they took uh, as being very important. Um, and this tax that the University of North Carolina was trying to introduce incoming freshmen to, <coughs> excuse me, was precisely a text that was designed to try to get them to think seriously about problems in the world, not to indoctrinate them, not to uh, get them to change religions, uh, but to try to get them to think uh, more carefully um, about the ideas that are going to confront them across the rest of their lives, and certainly was going to confront them uh, in, in the near future. I'm not sure all students uh, eventually uh, drew that lesson uh, from the assignment um, that had been offered to them, um, but for me, it was a bit of a wake-up call to realize just how many students were coming into universities without much of an appreciation about what universities were even for um, and what we were trying to do um, on college campuses. And I think these free speech debates that we see periodically um, revisit those same kinds of concerns uh, about uh, not only uh, the specific issue of free speech, um, but also the issue of why we ought to care about higher education more generally, and I think those two issues um, are fundamentally tied together. Some people in talking and writing about some of the recent free speech uh, controversies on campus um, have an instinct to want to blame the current uh, generation of students, um, that they are snowflakes, um, easily offended, um, not as capable as their elders um, of dealing with controversial and difficult um, ideas. Um, I think this is a mistake. It's a mistake in way of thinking about um, the current generation of students, and it's a mistake in thinking about the kinds of free speech controversies we, in fact, um, encounter um, on college campuses. And part of what I would want to emphasize, um, instead of thinking that this generation of students is unique or has unique difficulties um, in encountering um, and protecting uh, free speech, is to think about the challenges that we all face um, in thinking about how to tolerate those that we disagree with uh, dramatically, um, how to protect free speech uh, more broadly. Uh, empirical social scientists have done survey questions for decades now um, asking people about the importance of free speech, the importance of tolerating those um, that we disagree with. Um, they've been motivated to ask these questions in part um, out of emerging out of World War II, although they were asking these questions even before, but there was a concern about how do you have democracies that seem to collapse into dictatorships and abandon uh, liberal values? And part of the concern was, uh, maybe part of the reason why is because um, the average citizen was not as invested in those liberal values um, as we might have hoped. And so as a consequence, social scientists have surveyed um, lots of different populations, uh, college students, the average American voter, uh, politicians, journalists, lawyers, um, asking them various questions that revolve around the core theme of how important is free speech, how important is it to tolerate those you disagree with, um, how important is it um, to respect the rights um, of others. And one of the consistent findings across that literature, across several decades, regardless of which kind of population uh, you ask, is that people will repeatedly tell you um, that, of course, free speech is extraordinarily important. Of course, tolerance of those that we disagree with um, is extraordinarily important. 
But then if you start asking them further questions, give them particular examples to say, what about this example of free speech? And an example of somebody that you personally disagree with, um, that you find particularly offensive or disturbing or dangerous, uh, we find that most people uh, will quickly start backpedaling. They will start qualifying their commitment to free speech. They will start compromising their commitment to free speech. They will start saying, well, that's not what I meant uh, when I said we needed to tolerate people that we disagree with. That obviously is an abuse of free speech, not actual free speech. And this is not just a function of current college students. Americans um, across the board um, have this same reaction. Not only current college students, but college students of a generation ago, two generations opposed to their parents and grandparents, and examples of free speech and kinds of speakers that they find particularly disturbing and offensive. Well, this particular example um, is beyond the pale um, is a consistent and common one. And it's a challenge, I think, of, then, of, of liberal democracies we disagree with. But how do we execute that in practice um, so that we actually, when we encounter people that we have serious disagreements with, uh, we nonetheless learn uh, to listen to them, to argue with them, to deliberate with them, to work with them, uh, to come to uh, common solutions uh, to our common problems. So the book is concerned in part with these sort of basic fundamentals of thinking about what's important about democracies uh, more generally and how they work, but also specifically concerned uh, with why those of us on a university campus ought to be concerned um, with free speech. Um, for some public universities, of course, part of the reason why you're concerned with free speech is because judges tell you you have to. Um, there's American constitutional law that restricts what a college campus um, can do. Um, at state universities, and as a consequence, you have to worry about uh, what the rules are um, because somebody is ultimately going to enforce those rules against you. It's useful to know what those rules are. I think they're actually helpful for thinking through uh, free speech controversies. I think American constitutional law is very helpful for thinking about um, how to think through uh, free speech problems on American uh, college campuses uh, more generally. But I also think that it's separately important for us, for those of us who are on college campuses, to value free speech for our own reasons, not simply because uh, we're worried about lawsuits and we're worried about what some judge might tell you or because we happen to have a constitution that requires us um, to pay attention to free speech, at least in some circumstances, but because given our own goals and desires and mission, the, the rationale for this kind of community that we've formed on a college campus, we ought to care about free speech um, for our own reasons. And the reason why I think that's true is because the core mission of a university is ultimately about the production and dissemination of knowledge. The universities are designed to operate on the frontiers of what it is we know about the world, try to push those frontiers ever outward, and try to communicate what we've learned to others. And that requires the ability to engage in free speech more generally. It requires the ability to engage in free inquiry, to ask difficult questions and follow the, the uh, arguments and evidence and analysis in pursuit of those questions to whatever answers uh, might seem uh, reasonable. Free inquiry and open debate and free speech um, is largely irrelevant if what we think universities are primarily all about is indoctrinating a uh, current set of students, merely communicating a storehouse of knowledge um, to a new generation that the old generation wants to take for granted. Fundamentally, that's not how we understand universities, and we don't understand that to be the role of universities in the modern world. Instead, universities are places where there's experimentation, there's unconventional thinking, and ultimately there are mistakes that are going to be made. As we try to push on the boundaries of human knowledge, try to learn new things, test out new ideas, see how far they can go, um, and then uh, learn from those um, efforts. And if we're going to do that, and if we're going to do that successfully, then we have to have space on a university campus um, to think seriously about hard ideas, um, and sometimes um, to make mistakes, sometimes to think about bad ideas. Um, but if we lose that ability, uh, we're going to lose a lot of what college campuses um, are doing and what they're contributing to American society more generally. This has not always been the vision of American universities. Um, Princeton University, my own institution, is a very old institution. We like to brag about how old we are. Um, but in fact, if you look at, um, and with that has great old buildings and other kinds of things um, that's associated with it, which is great. But if you look at what Princeton looked like um, early in its um, history, it was a radically different institution uh, than it is today. And it's not only radically different because there's a different set of people and kind of people um, at the university um, in its early days as opposed to who's at the university today, but it's also different in terms of its own institutional mission and what it understood itself to be doing. 
Um, Princeton at the time uh, was much more interested in indoctrinating a new generation uh, with the wisdom of their elders. And as a consequence, there wasn't a lot of space for tolerance and free speech um, and open inquiry um, on the Princeton campus or lots of other university campuses um, early in its history. It's really a function of changes that have been made in the late 19th and early 20th century in which educational reformers remade institutions like Princeton as well as launched a lot of new institutions that were dedicated to a very different mission um, than the old mission that places like Harvard and Princeton were initially established to do. So Daniel Coit Gilman was one of these um, educational reformers from the late 19th century. He was the first president of Johns Hopkins uh, University, which was founded um, shortly after uh, the Reconstruction era. And in his presidential address to his board of trustees as he's helped lay out the mission of Johns Hopkins and what he understood the new organization to be, he laid down a set of ideals. I think they're very consistent uh, with, in fact, what modern American um, institutions of higher education um, are committed to uh, more generally. So Gilman says, uh, the institution we are about to organize would not be worthy of a name of the university if it were to be devoted to any other purpose than the discovery and promulgation of the truth. And it would be ignoble in the extreme if the resources which have been given by the founder without restrictions should be limited to the maintenance of ecclesiastical differences or perverted to the promotion of political strife. As the spirit of the university should be that of intellectual freedom and the pursuit of truth, and the broadest charity toward those with whom we differ in opinion, it is certain that sectarian and partisan preferences should have no control in the selection of teachers and should not be apparent in the official work of the university. Gilman's vision of a university was as a place where you could bring together a, a large number of people with wide-ranging views, diverse perspectives and experiences, and have them talk together about serious and important ideas in a common pursuit of the truth. Those people are going to disagree among themselves about what the right answers are. They're going to disagree among themselves about what the right questions to be asking are. Um, but ultimately, universities would be sacrificing their own missions if they began to try to censor those debates, if they tried to restrict what it was um, that scholars and students were doing on those campuses um, in order to guide them in some preset directions rather than leave them free to engage in open inquiry. So the book tries to lay out then that liberal case for why we ought to care about free speech in a truth-seeking institution of this sort. And I won't elaborate here on the details of that argument. Let me just point out a couple of key claims I want to make in the book and then move to thinking about some of the particular kinds of controversies and how these principles can help us work through thinking about some of those controversies, which what the book is concerned with as well. So one of those points is that the only way in which we're going to gain true knowledge and be confident in what it is we know is through argument. They were willing to hold our ideas up to critical scrutiny from those who disagree with us and see whether or not they have the better side of the argument than we have, see what their evidence is, see what their analysis looks like, see what their criticisms are, so that we can know the strength of our own arguments and also know the weaknesses of our own arguments, to know what it is we have to abandon, what it is we have to modify and reform and try to improve, and what it is we should um, cherish and hold on to precisely because we now have more confidence that we're right. That's what universities are fundamentally all about, and fundamentally, if we're going to engage in that kind of robust exchange of ideas, that deep criticism of commitments, uh, we have to have the freedom to do that on college campuses if we want to pursue the truth and know the truth at all. But secondarily, we can also learn a lesson from the history of American constitutional law and our own constitutional experience, uh, which is that in the context of controversial speech, precisely where people disagree about what's true and what's not, what's right and what's wrong, we can't trust any potential censor with the power to suppress that speech. We have learned that ultimately we have to make our own mistakes. We have to evaluate ideas for ourselves. We can't simply delegate to somebody else, whether it's a government official or a campus official, the power to make choices for us as to which speech is likely to be correct and which speech is likely to be wrong, which speech is likely to be true, which speech is likely to be false, um, and then save us from having to be exposed to that speech that that censor thinks uh, we shouldn't hear. Instead, we've made the decision after um, a long, hard experience of decades and even centuries to come to the conclusion that we should have to hear those ideas, we should be exposed to the controversial speech uh, visibly in front of everyone and make up our own minds about what we think um, is true and what we think is false. So with these kinds of principles in mind, I think we're better positioned to think through the kinds of controversies that actually arise on college campuses. And I take it at the very heart of the university's operations, uh, we, should be, respect, we can, should be concerned with respecting the freedom to pursue scholarship and teaching with regard only to the professional standards and the pursuit of truth and without regard 
to social and political pressures uh, more generally. This is what the concept of academic freedom is designed um, to protect. Not the freedom for scholars and teachers on campuses to say uh, whatever they would like, but the freedom to push the boundaries of human knowledge, the freedom to engage in open inquiry of hard questions in accord with disciplinary standards, in accord with a set of expectations about what a community scholar uh, thinks about how we ought to pursue those questions uh, more generally. It remains a struggle to protect academic freedom on college campuses. There are institutions and practices and norms that we ought to be trying to foster on college campuses in order to protect that core work that scholars and teachers are doing on college campuses. Um, but in addition to that, we also should be concerned with what's more properly characterized as free speech. That is not simply the inquiry into serious scholarly questions in accord with scholarly standards, but also the much more robust, more democratic, more egalitarian debate that also occurs um, on college campuses. College campuses are not simply about the scholarly enterprise and trying to protect the scholarly enterprise of research and teaching. Campuses are also places where we try to bring together with a wide, people with wide range of views to talk about matters of common concern uh, in a relatively um, serious uh, way. They are places where we talk about controversial ideas, and not only that in a scholarly manner that, that faculty might be engaged in, but also in the manner that students uh, find attractive and engaging with uh, more generally. That's part of what uh, universities offer uh, to the American public and American society more generally is a forum in which uh, we can have those democratic conversations about important ideas. And a great deal would be lost on university campuses if we were reducing them to nothing more uh, than the research and the teaching that the faculty on those campuses do. We de need both free speech and academic freedom um, on a college campus. But recognizing this role of universities for robust public debate has meant, for example, um, that universities have allowed students to form numerous groups of their own and given them equal access to resources to explore their own interests and concerns um, on a college campus. That's often been difficult for colleges to uh, recognize and adhere to uh, in practice. It's been a long fight um, to get universities to actually uh, respect the ability of students to pursue their own interest on a college campus and associate among themselves um, to pursue interests of common concerns. Um, sometimes in the context of public universities, that's led to lawsuits in which students have struggled uh, in the courts in order to force campus administrators um, to allow them to pursue those interests. So for example, Virginia Commonwealth University, like lots of other universities at the time, uh, tried to ban the Gay Alliance for Students in the 1970s for promoting what university officials characterized as aberrant, even sickening ideas, ideas that were in fact illegal um, under state law at the time. And a federal circuit court had to point out to those university officials that student associations devoted to advocacy of political, social, legal, and other objectives are part of higher education and ultimately useful for the preparation for later life. Students should have the opportunity on a college campus to explore ideas that their elders might find sickening and aberrant or even dangerous um, because that's what universities are for and that's how we prepare citizens for thinking about the hard issues they're gonna have to confront and think through for the rest of their lives. But recognizing this role of universities for robust public debate has also meant, for example, that universities ha should have robust spaces available for, pub for public protest on college campuses. Students and others should be able to express their views on matters of common concern, and they should be able to express their views in ways that make sense to them and they can gain attention from others to the issues that they care about. But at the same time, it's inappropriate for protests to take the form of interfering with the ability of others to pursue their own activities. Willing speakers should be able to communicate with willing audiences. Members of the campus community um, should be able to hear from people uh, that they find uh, of interest and in the ideas that they want to engage in. Disruptions, disinvitations, tearing down signs, throwing out newspapers are all efforts to quash the communication of ideas and shut down the free exchange of ideas rather than enhance and advance those ideas. Students have a right to ignore speech that they find appalling or unpersuasive or to take up the challenge of countering such speech uh, with arguments of their own. They need not engage with um, ideas that they think are on uh, matters of settled um, topics, but they don't have the privilege to insist that no one else be allowed to treat those questions as unsettled or worth further examination or unresolved and worth uh, further consideration. A college campus cannot claim to be serious about trying to create an environment open to skeptical inquiry and the free-ranging pursuit of the truth if it cannot tolerate the airing of controversial and discomforting ideas on the campus. Faculty and administrators do not have the courage of their convictions 
is they cannot tolerate having their students hear from speakers that faculty administrators think are obnoxious or mistaken. But that also implies a responsibility on the, on the part of those that are bringing speakers to campus and hosting discussions on a college campus. The faculty hired by a university are evaluated by their peers for the quality of their scholarly work and their ability to meet disciplinary expectations about the understanding of their subject matter. Outside speakers who are brought to campus to discuss public affairs are not expected to meet those same high scholarly standards. Their contribution to the academic community, to the scholarly community on a college campus is different than the contributions being made um, by the faculty, but hopefully their contributions are still real. But the goal in bringing in such speakers should be ultimately to enlighten and not merely to provoke. Students should want to hear from the best representatives of serious ideas that are worth their time and attention. And no doubt students will have a different idea about what's worth their time and attention than I might have, uh, for example. Um, but they should take seriously their own responsibility to contribute um, to the campus community and the intellectual life of the, of the campus community uh, more generally. They should be seeking knowledge and not simply pushing boundaries. When we are making decisions about whom to invite to a campus to speak, the goal should be neither to stack the deck with our closest allies nor to sprinkle in the most extreme provocateurs. The goal should be to make available to the campus community thoughtful representatives of serious ideas. Embracing free speech is easy. The speech never seems very challenging. It is easy to listen to pleasing ideas and affirmation of our own prior beliefs. It is much more difficult to learn to tolerate those with whom we disagree and who espouse ideas we find preposterous, repugnant, or even dangerous. We should, however, learn not only to tolerate those disagreements, but to seek them out. For it is through controversy and contestation that we can make progress, and often in the most unexpected ways. So let me end by noting that universities sometimes struggle to sustain the kind of diverse intellectual communities um, that in fact help and facilitate the advancement and dissemination of knowledge. John Stuart Mill worried that in a closed society, too comfortable in its own convictions would retreat into dogmatism. Despite their own aspirations, universities risk their own retreat in comfortable intellectual bubbles. The university must strive to screen out bad ideas, but it must also strive to bring to campus those who will question, not merely affirm, received wisdom. If a community of scholars is not to become lethargic and um, the, the advancement of knowledge is to proceed, um, scholars cannot become complacent in their studies and blind to their own deficiencies and biases. Universities should be striving to nurture intellectual diversity on their own college campuses when training, hiring, and promoting scholars who make their home on those campuses. Universities should demand rigor and professional accomplishment but also openness to new ideas and a spirit of skepticism and intellectual curiosity. If universities are to operate on the outer boundaries of our state of knowledge and push those boundaries further outward, they must be places where new, unorthodox, controversial, and disturbing ideas can be raised and scrutinized. If students are to prepare themselves to critically engage with the wide range of ideas that they will encounter across their lifetimes, they need to learn how to grapple with and critically examine those ideas while they're still on the college campus, even when they find those ideas difficult and offensive. For more than a century, universities have been committed to the mission of advancing and disseminating knowledge and recognize that the free-ranging exchange of ideas is critical to that kind of mission. Universities have often pursued that mission imperfectly, um, and they have sometimes had to be called to account to better appreciate and respect um, the ideals that they claim that they value. But recognizing and respecting the principles of free speech is ultimately difficult and challenging. But ultimately, there's no um, alternative if we're dedicated to the pursuit of truth. And it's that dedication to the pursuit of truth that is the noble mission of universities and that we ought to try to maintain into the future. So thank you very much. I'm there? Okay. There you go. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, one of the, the, the question I have is that a, a lot of what I heard in your presentation had a series of values in it that are values that you espouse as your vision 
for how the university should be. And the dilemma that I face in front of that is outside of the constitutional limits, those series of values being put forward by you or anybody else are a debate, essentially. And uh, to the extent we put in place things like principles or whatever, essentially that's vehiculing a set of values that the person behind those principles is, uh, is addressing. And that's a problem that I just have with us moving beyond a basic constitution. The other thing is on disruption. Um, I was tempted when you were talking about that to stand up and turn around just as a teaching moment, sure. right? Some people would consider that profoundly disruptive, right? But possibly from somebody's point of view, that would be their way of feeling or getting around the sense of brutalization by a given speaker sure. in a different setting. And we've had people in here who have done things uh, or said things that are so profoundly offensive to people that students and sometimes people in the community and sometimes uh, faculty have felt they've had to push back. The word is disruption. Somebody else who would look at that as just the dialogue. So you know, how, how do you address that kind of space, i.e., just staying with the constitutional space and the idea of one person's disruption is another person's free speech? Yeah, so I think those are both very um, useful points to get on the table. So um, um, I think you're right that it's a challenge to think about what the, what the purposes and values and mission are of a university. Um, we likely are going to disagree about some of those values, and we ought to be having conversations about those values and try to shape what kind of communities we're trying to form. Um, I don't think everyone at all universities are going to come to the same conclusion about this. And so, um, like I said, I think most American universities uh, over the past 100 plus years have mostly been dedicated um, to this um, commitment to robust inquiry, uh, free inquiry into um, a range of, of ideas in the pursuit of the truth, ultimately. Um, but there's space for universities to go different ways on that. Um, I think public universities are somewhat constrained by American constitutional laws to how much range they might have, but private universities have a lot more flexibility about what they might do. We certainly know that some religious institutions, for example, um, understand themselves as to be grounded in a set of common beliefs that they take on faith, and as a consequence for some of those institutions, there are certain ideas that are off the table and can't be talked about, can't be critically scrutinized, um, because they have to be taken as givens uh, rather than something that's held up to scrutiny um, on those college campuses. I think it's not unreasonable that we might have institutions and communities of scholars organized around those kinds of principles. And you can imagine others, not just religious institutions, but secular institutions that make similar kinds of commitments. Um, personally, I wouldn't necessarily want to be associated with those institutions. I think that they are not um, as true to the core mission of a university as what we would hope, but I think within the wide range of institutions of higher education in the United States, there's value in having communities that are like that as long as they're transparent about what their commitments are, uh, what people are signing on to when they decide to attend. Um, I think it's perfectly reasonable to organize those kind of institutions and see how many people are attracted to them um, and have those communities in place because they can accomplish certain things, even if I think what they can accomplish is more limited than what I hope um, other institutions uh, might be able to accomplish more, more generally. Um, but I think those are conversations we have to be having. And, and, I, and one reason why I think it's important for us to actually take seriously these free speech issues and try to think them through and, and think them through in the context of thinking through what the purpose of higher education is more generally, precisely because the, the, this is how we maintain ourselves as communities, um, is by having these conversations and reaffirming and reconsidering uh, the kinds of values and commitments we really have um, uh, as communities. Um, and then trying to impart those, hopefully, um, to those who are going to be joining those uh, communities in the future. Um, on the question of disruption, um, I, I'm probably mostly with you on the, on the disruption issue. And so I, I um, have been uh, distressed, I think, on how some people want to exploit um, this problem of uh, disruption of uh, speakers and, and talks um, in order to be far more restrictive than I think is actually necessary um, on a college campus. 
and, and often more punitive than I think is necessary um, in order to uh, address these concerns. Um, I think that we have some real issues on college campuses, of actual instances in which um, uh, people are um, wanting to uh, prevent the effective communication of ideas, and as a consequence, they want to engage in tactics um, that are really designed to um, suppress speech and prevent people from having um, conversations. But we should also recognize that people feel passionately about ideas that will lead to a boisterous and raucous debate, um, and that we ought to make space for that. Um, so certainly the idea of standing up and turning your back on a speaker I don't think is disruptive in any way. And so as a consequence, I think it's perfectly uh, reasonable um, uh, as a tactic, maybe unreasonable in context. So it'd be wrong for you to turn your back on me. But, um, but, but, not, a, but, but not an unreasonable thing to be able to do in a, in a classroom. And likewise, I think it, the, uh, in a public uh, setting of a public talk like this, for example, um, uh, uh, asking tough questions, uh, reacting um, uh, emotionally to something that's been said, I think is not unreasonable as long as it's not so disruptive that we can't continue to have the conversation, which is one reason why I'm actually very skeptical, I think, of, of one-size-fits-all, very punitive standards designed to regulate those things, because I worry um, that uh, things that are really sort of a, a reflection of the seriousness of the exchange of ideas will instead be taken as moments of obstruction. They're too disruptive and, and uh, lead to harsh penalties um, on those engaged with them. Um, so I think on the one hand, we need to be clear about what our expectations are, that we want to be able to have the exchange of ideas. Uh, but part of that exchange of ideas is also people pushing back and, and uh, resisting in various ways. Um, you know, so somebody comes up and a uh, speaker and, and is ringing a cowbell um, such that the speaker cannot um, present their talk, as happened recently at Portland State, for example, uh, in which um, campus security stood by because they thought, well, the cowbell is just as much free speech as the speaker, um, I think misunderstands what it is we're trying to accomplish um, in a university environment. On the other hand, if someone, um, uh, you know, a leader like in the midst of a state of the union shakes their head no and says that that's clearly wrong um, while somebody's speaking, but then we can able to move on and have our talk, then we're fine, right? And then there's no disruption on that front. So I think it's actually important both for those who are um, wanting to be too aggressive um, in patrolling uh, campus free speech, but also those who are maybe a little too relaxed about how they think about free speech. In order to find some common ground guided by the core principle we ought to be concerned with is, can we have an exchange of ideas and talk seriously about things? And if we can do that, we're doing okay. I don't know, it depends on where the mic goes. I'm not in control of the mic. One, just one follow up on that. In a setting like this, where after a person speaks, yep. there is applause many times, or even after a comment, there's applause. Sure. That kind of uh, validating of the speaker kind of applause is a form of speech, too. Sure, sure. Let people receiving the speaker differently will consider it to be brutalizing, too. And, and how, you know, how do we reconcile that? Do we, like, not clap if we enjoyed the speaker? Yeah, I no, enjoyed you. I clapped. I just want to let you know. No, no sometimes it's reasonable to boo the speaker, right? <laughs> so it's, uh, which, is, which is fine. Right? I mean, that's, that's also an engagement, an expression of, of the ideas, and I think that's totally fine. And, and you know, uh, you know I, I would hope that no speaker on a college campus is so delicate that they can't um, tolerate some booing um, if, if that's the reasonable response. Um, I don't expect students to boo me in my classroom while I'm trying to go to the lecture in class, right? So I think our standards and expectations have to be somewhat different in different kinds of contexts. But public talk is different than what we're trying to do in a classroom, for example. And the rules and standards and norms that we should expect ought to guide our behavior in that context is somewhat different than what we ought to do in a classroom. And universities ought to recognize that we have complex physical and, um, and metaphorical spaces uh, on campus, and the rules of the road are a little different in those different in those different spaces, but still guided by a core common principle that ultimately what we're all about is trying to get ideas on the table and talk about them seriously. Yeah. Um, I agree with your speech. In fact, it reminds me of Persig's um, argument in Senate Automotive Motorcycle Maintenance on the Church of Reason. Mm -hmm. However, Reason faces budget constraints. $100,000 to protect a speaker with 25 students are listening, and I'm saying the most brilliant, insightful speaker. Yeah. Peaceful protesters outside means $100,000 that's not hiring a professor, $100,000 that's not hiring staff, and alternatives. There's a finite amount of resources to protect free speech. Right. How to resolve this resource constraint in our goal of aggressive and robust debate? Thank you. Yeah, I think the resource constraint is a real one, um, and, and I think it's... Uh, uh, a worrisome one, and I'm hoping 
uh, frankly, that as a practical matter, it does not become uh, what people are worried it is becoming. Um, so I think there are those who want to exploit the fact that there are resource constraints in order to try to put speakers in front of college audiences, um, precisely in order to encourage disruption, in order to ramp up security costs, um, precisely to damage universities um, uh, because of that need to spend money on things that we preferably would not have to spend money on. Um, although I'd recognize that there's, there are two sides of that coin, right? Because it's not only the speaker who's being provocative or being, are the people who are bringing in the speaker to be provocative, um, they're stirring people up in the first place, but also the reactions of those that are generating the necessity um, of the greater security cost uh, and, and the like. And those people too need to, I think, reevaluate what it is they're up to um, in order to think through, is this really the best for the institution as a whole, um, that this is what we're engaged in. Um, I think if we found that happening all the time, and if we devolved into a culture um, in which um, it's necessary to have uh, strict security at lots of events in order to protect the ability to um, have an exchange of ideas on a college campus, uh, one, we've lost something really serious about college campus, and I think trying to talk through ahead of time what our principles are hopefully gets us to a place where we don't need the cops in, involved in order to prevent that from happening. But in addition, if we find ourselves in that situation, I think we will, in fact, have to limit how much speech occurs on college campuses. And then we're going to be faced with difficult choices about how to do that in a neutral way that's not primarily saying, well, those people that are bringing in the controversial speakers um, need to be silenced because they're the ones ramping up the security costs. We're going to have to do it in a much more even-handed way. And that will result in less overall speech, less overall exchange of ideas on college campuses as a whole. Um, I am hopeful that we're not actually going to encounter that. Um, I think some universities are badly situated in this regard, so Berkeley, I think, has a genuine problem on its hands. Um, and it has a problem on its hands um, in part because it's of symbolic significance, and so people want to create protests there, um, in part because there are lots of outside activists nearby who come to campus in order to make trouble, and it's one thing um, to try to encourage your own community um, to behave better and try to establish some expectations of conduct and that to be managed more effectively. Much tougher if people are coming out outside university campuses um, and involving themselves in protest on, on your campus, and that does ramp up security costs. Um, so I think Berkeley is actually in a tough situation. I'm hopeful the fact that they were able and willing to spend a lot of money as a visible show that they're willing to do this um, will um, reduce their need to continue doing it over time. Um, I think most other campuses are probably not going to find themselves in that situation over the long term. But, but it would be helpful um, in, in order to uh, reduce that threat um, if both we talked to people who were thinking about who to bring to campus and try to talk to them seriously about why are you bring these people to campus and who are you bringing and what's going to be accomplished by doing it. Hopefully we can move away from uh, bringing the people to campus simply to stick a thumb in somebody's eye um, and be as provocative as possible. And instead try to bring people to campus that are going to have a more reasonable exchange of ideas that might not be as entertaining, but hopefully won't require as much security. Um, and also, at the same time, try to talk to those who want to be disruptive and try to encourage them to think about what's the best way of expressing your set of concerns here um, in a way that um, uh, doesn't necessarily require the intervention of the police and law enforcement in order to keep the peace, um, but nonetheless can uh, express the concerns you have about a given speaker and what they have to say on, on a campus. But, hard, but I think it's a genuine hard problem, and, and in practice it could become um, really damaging to universities if, if, if we find ourselves in a bad dynamic on this. I don't know where the mic is. Ah, oh, there you go. Hi. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you for coming this afternoon. Uh, fortunately, here at UT Law, I don't think we have much censorship by the administration. They actually foster the free flow of ideas. I think the major roadblock comes from students, myself often included, from being too prideful to consider opposing views to the point that civil discussion can only happen between people who already agree on almost everything. Yeah. Um, higher education is so expensive, especially graduate education, that it tends to draw people already set in their values. So how do we break down this roadblock um, in ourselves and our peers? Thank you. I think that's tough. I mean, I think, I think, the, I think it's actually relatively easy to uh, think through the policy and practices that universities have and try to make them as best they can be um, on this front. You can design reasonable policies um, and implement them in reasonable ways. It's a much tougher nut to crack as to how do you change the culture on a campus and how do you get students to respond to this. And this is, as your concern is, how do you actually encourage people to go out and engage the hard ideas that they disagree with because they um, think they don't necessarily have anything to learn, they think they already have a set of commitments, they don't actually want to hear um, the criticisms of those commitments. Um, 
but also how do you get um, students um, to feel comfortable expressing ideas that they think might be in the minority on a given campus? And, and there's a lot of peer pressure um, to hold your tongue when you, when you think you might say something that will cause offense or that other students are going to react badly to. Um, and that leads to um, uh, less frank conversations and, and less useful and, and um, helpful conversations um, if that's the culture we try to foster. Um, I think part of that task is trying to um, uh, be clear with students about what it is we're trying to accomplish on a college campus um, and, and be clear to them that um, uh, they can gain something, even if they think that they uh, know what their commitments are and, they're, and they think they are committed to those commitments, um, they can nonetheless gain something by experiencing those who have disagreements. Um, and it's not always the case that the point of having those conversations um, is holding out the possibility you might be converted um, to the opposition. That sometimes might happen, but I think that's mostly not uh, what we ought to think is going to happen or that we ought to be encouraging people to uh, be focused on as the reason to engage in those conversations. Um, but instead, you want to be thinking through, what are the concerns people have about my own position? How can I build my position so it's stronger um, and more persuasive to others? Uh, what are the weaknesses in my position where I need to go back and rethink what it is I'm committed to in order to think through it more carefully? I come out of conversations with people that I have dramatic disagreements with, um, sometimes changing my mind dramatically, but often not changing my mind dramatically, but nonetheless walking away thinking, I have to think more carefully about what it is I believe um, and what ideas I have here because there are issues I hadn't thought through, there are concerns I haven't thought through, I don't know the angle of how to explain this well um, to somebody else, and I learn a lot through those conversations. And I might not be converted and they might not be converted, but at the end of the day we both hopefully walk away with a better appreciation of the set of ideas that are at stake here um, and a more sophisticated understanding of those ideas. You know, I tell my students in my classes, um, I'm not trying to persuade them to anything in particular. Um, I'm not necessarily concerned that at the end of the day they come to agreement with me about um, difficult issues that we uh, start off uh, disagreeing about. What I'm concerned about is at the end of the day um, they have more sophisticated understandings of the problems. Um, that to the extent we're confronting hard issues, I want them to be thinking carefully about those hard issues. And, and it'd be nice if they came to the same conclusion as me. But I'm used to people disagreeing with me. I have a teenage daughter. She disagrees with me all the time. It's familiar territory. Um, I understand I'm not going to persuade everybody. But what I do hope is that we can actually lead us to a place where we can be more thoughtful about our disagreements. Um, and actually engaging with people that we're opposed to is the way we're going to become more thoughtful about, the, about those disagreements. Um, but it's often hard and challenging. Oh, is this one? There it is. There. So my question directly relates to how a university um, should address free speech and how it should teach their incoming students and, and current enrollees uh, free speech, what it is, what is protected, and what is not protected. Right. So for instance, as we've seen, uh, universities take an active role in sexual assault prevention uh, when it comes to orientation and how they uh, introduce students to that subject and continue that, educa that educational experience throughout their, their time on the university. Should that same uh, stance to be taken when it comes to free speech to teach students what is free speech, what is protected, what is not, especially with the modern trend that uh, any speech that is opposing uh, is a call to violence or is hate speech and therefore can be suppressed with violence. Yeah, I think absolutely. I think we need to do a much better job of this and, and, we, and uh, we, we've taken a lot of things for granted that we really shouldn't take for granted on college campuses. Um, I, I think in part that means that part of our orientation for incoming undergraduates um, ought to be trying to convey to them um, what the purpose of a university is, what does free speech look like, what does academic freedom look like, why do we value these things, what our expectations are of how people engage with others um, on a college campus. Um, that, that ought to be as core to what we're doing in orienting students to the new enterprise and community that they're joining um, as other things we're trying to inform them of uh, during that orientation process. Um, Again, that's not always going to be the case then that we're going to beat them into submission and make them um, uh, agree about um, how to do those things, but we want them to be thinking carefully about the difficulties of these problems um, and how we ought to start engaging them. Um, but I think that task is not actually just limited to thinking about um, how do we orient incoming freshmen. I think it's also a question of how do we train grad students, how do we deal with faculty who are joining communities. One thing about university communities is that they're constantly changing. There's constantly new people coming in. Um, 
part of that uh, challenge of having new people coming in is sometimes they will disagree about what the commitments of the, of the community is, and we ought to be having a conversation about what the commitments of the, of the community is. Um, and sometimes that's going to lead us to change uh, what those commitments look like over time. But partially it's also about socializing people into, this is the community you're joining, here are the values that we hold, here's why we hold them, um, here's what we think follows from that. Um, and that's partially a socialization process, but it's partially a genuine process of persuasion and discussion. Uh, about what that ought to look like. Um, and, and like I said, I think that's important not only for incoming students, but it's equally important for, for those who are going to become faculty and scholars um, on, a, on a college campus who um, often have not thought very carefully about these issues um, either. Um, and for that matter, it's important for people like members of the Board of Trustees of universities, for senior leadership um, on university campuses. These are also often people who have not thought very carefully about academic freedom and free speech issues. Um, these are sometimes, especially thinking about board trustees, people come from other walks of life, not very familiar with the scholarly enterprise and what universities actually look like um, in practice. And I think it's critically important that those people also be oriented to what is the enterprise here that you're going to help oversee and help protect and nurture, um, and what are your expectations. We've seen a lot of instances um, in recent years of uh, members of board of trustees of universities, for example, being the first to turn on faculty, for example, or students who say something controversial on college campuses. And those ought to be the people that are defending um, uh, speech and robust debate um, on college campuses. Um, and so we ought to be doing a better job of trying to talk to those people as well who are taking those leadership positions within universities about what is it you're leading? Um, what's the enterprise that you're going to help foster here? Um, and why do we value it? And what does it look like? And, and how should it be uh, carried out? And try to get those people thinking about those questions before we find ourselves in the midst of the controversy, before we're divided about this particular offensive thing somebody has said. Um, when at that point, it's very easy to lose track, right? And we, we um, polarize and we pick sides. Um, but before we get to that point, it'd be helpful to think about what our basic principles are so we can try to be reminded of those when, when we're in the midst of actual controversies um, and, and contestation. Hello, thank you uh, for your speech today. Um, so social media is a very prominent tool in this day and age uh, with both students, faculty, and the entity of universities engaging on them. I'm curious what your thoughts are on their influence as well as um, how both staff and faculty should utilize, regulate, nurture, what sort of presence that right. can have on the campus. Thank yeah. you. Uh, it's, I mean, it's obviously important. It's, I think it's going to grow importance, and I think it's going to continue creating um, controversies on college campuses. I mean, a lot of the debates um, that we've seen uh, lately and controversies we've seen lately um, that touch on uh, academic freedom issues and the freedom of faculty um, uh, to uh, uh, articulate uh, opinions and ideas uh, has exactly been driven by things people have said in social media um, context. Um, there's not any filter between what you say. It's an unmediated um, uh, discourse. It's easy to take those things out of context in which they were initially promoted. It's easy to bring them into a, a different community and put them in front of a different uh, set of eyes um, that was not the community, the people, an audience people had in mind when they were writing the things in the first place. So things are sometimes taken out of context and misread as a consequence of that, and that will generate controversies. But it's also true in that kind of unmediated space, people will say things are controversial. Um, and sometimes offensive and sometimes just dumb, and they shouldn't have said it, um, and, and nonetheless people will. And so I expect that we will continue to see those um, kind of controversies rise, so it becomes particularly important how we think about them. Um, I would hope that academics in particular um, would uh, be uh, responsible and mature adults um, on social media and try to bear in mind that their goal in communicating with the public in social media ought to also be to bring enlightenment and not merely provocation. Um, that's hard. It's not always done. It's, I mean, so I thought I would never join social media. I joined Twitter a couple of years ago now. Um, so I'm part of the problem, probably. Um, um, and, you know, but part of what I'm also trying to guide, be guided by is uh, where can I intervene in debates in which I try to bring my own scholarly expertise to bear on issues of public concern is why I joined Twitter in the first place is because I think there are important issues in, in public conversation that I had some responsibility to actually be part of. Um, but I am not fulfilling that responsibility if I'm just adding heat instead of light um, to those fires. Um, and so I know it's often tempting, and, I'm, and people have reasons to want to um, add heat to some of these um, debates as well, and we ought to tolerate people who do that. Um, but at the same time, um, I think the inst our institutions and our professions would be better served if as much as possible 
um, we're actually trying to communicate ideas in a serious way, um, even in 280 characters, um, uh, to the general public, and even on issues uh, that we care very passionately about. We ought to be trying to model good public discourse um, on these issues, uh, rather than uh, dragging things uh, into the gutter, and too often we do. Um, and when people find themselves in the midst of controversies over those things, we ought to come to their defense. Um, they have the right to engage in those things, and we want to protect that space. Um, but um, I think we also have some responsibility as, as individuals um, uh, to try to um, uh, navigate this space in a, in a responsible way um, so that we don't unnecessarily uh, generate controversy. That's not going to make all the controversies go away, um, but there's no reason to feed the, feed the fire of controversies around higher education by um, going out and provoking people. Thank you. Thank you.